double check on that if you can. Uh, oh, we're live now. I see the little sign. Um, well, everybody, welcome. Um, super excited to be able to have um, you know the the uh, moderator seat for this panel today. Um, many of you that uh, are associated with uh, IDSA um, or identity in general, um, you know, certainly know enough of my background. Um, no introductions on my end, other than the fact that I don't have the bow tie. Um, I do have a Manhattan, so I'm kind of easing back into, uh, you know, the old traditions and rituals of my speaking habits. Um, but we are uh, really, really fortunate today to have um, a, a, a panel of folks that I think, you know, as we go through this conversation, you're going to be floored, right? Their experiences, if you've, if you've only ever met one or two of them or none of them, um, I'm going to tell you the, the backgrounds that they come from, the experiences that they've had, which aren't entirely aligned, you know, just to traditional identity, um, you know, diversity of backgrounds uh, from an experience standpoint. Um, when we dive into this subject of what's missing in identity, I think that their perspectives are really going to um, cause you to pause and think. And we'll certainly talk a little bit about solutions and efforts that we can make uh, together to improve on all the things that are missing within identity. Um, with that being said, though, I'm going to uh, kick off uh, introductions and have each one of my guests introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with uh, start with Eve Mahler, if I could, please. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks, Richard, for inviting me. It's really nice to meet my new friends here. Um, I'm Eve Mailer. I am Forge Rock's CTO. Uh, Forge Rock is all about helping people safely and simply access the connected world. And we've been doing identity before we were Forge Rock, having had uh, roots in Sun. And um, I've been doing identity before there was an I in it, kind of. Uh, when we worked on SAML, the security assertion markup language, you know, talking about identity wasn't really quite a thing yet. Um, but, you know, we had a hand in, I, I think, putting together some of the major design patterns that have stayed with us uh, in the industry. And I'm really excited to be partaking of it now, uh, particularly with the, the privacy aspects and the, the trustfulness aspects coming in um, to identities that are not just about workforce, they're really about everybody and everything. That's me. Excellent. Thank you, Eva. I appreciate that. Jamie, if I could have you introduce yourself to the audience. Absolutely. My name is Jamie Lewis Gross. I am the VP of Solution Engineering here at Stadium for North America. I have more years than I really care to admit uh, working on the professional services side of the house. So I have product experience helping Fortune 1000 companies to architect identity governance and cloud security solutions. I've held a variety of global enterprise leadership roles, uh, having to do with consulting and really guiding uh, customers through workshops, program formulation, and ultimately the development of IAM roadmaps to make them successful in their endeavor. So thank you for having me, Richard. I'm excited. Well, I'm very glad that you're here with us. And um, I'm going to um, pitch over to an old friend. Um, we've been... Uh, we, I always like to say that uh, we've been in the trenches together um, for, for a long time. Um, I'm very excited to have Helen Patton here with us. And if you can introduce yourself, Helen. Sure. Old friend, Richard, just <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so Helen Patton, I am currently an advisory CISO at Cisco. Um, Boy, uh, before that, eight years as the CISO at Ohio State, and as you may know, higher ed is where we blend consumer identities and professional identities and dead people's identities and everything all in one big cesspool of identity. So higher ed for eight years, learned a lot about identity there. And then prior to that, I was 10 years at JP Morgan, which is where I bumped into Richard. Uh, doing a lot in the identity certification spaces uh, for financial, <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, <laughs> shiver. Uh, for, yeah, so uh, this identity thing has been going on for a long time in my career, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much, Helen. And thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us that's watching, as well as for, you know, those of my panel members that have agreed to jump on this thing with me, because I will tell you, as we were kind of going through the preliminaries on this, I, I made a statement that uh, my goal was that it would be 10% Richard speaking and 90% my panel speaking. And I will tell you that all of my panelists began to take immediate bets on the probability of that actually happening. Um, but actually, I think it's really interesting, Helen, you mentioned something going back to our chase days that I think is fascinating because it's been a thread that's been um, kind of pulled recently. Um, and I think it represents where where the big question is, the first question that I'll put on the table for everybody. Um, and that is, you know, what's missing in identity? Um, and, and the 
thread that, you know, is is kind of an interesting connection point is this whole notion of certification. Um, I did twitch. Um, it did feel a little bit like PTSD. Um, but I, I have gotten into a pretty kind of healthy, vigorous debate around how um, unhelpful uh, certification as a mandated uh, requirement is. Uh, many companies have to go through it on a quarterly basis, some annual, um, but it's thousands of companies. And it hasn't you know, really kind of move the needle and understanding the importance of identity and access, entitlements, attributes, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and it, it seems like, you know, Groundhog Day pretty regularly if you work on identity. I mean, I was having these same arguments about certification nearly 13 years ago. Um, so, you know, as we talk a little bit about what's missing in identity, I'd be interested in your, your perceptions or your thoughts on, you know, what are the things that, that feel like we're stuck in the mud, that we're not making you know, these substantial dramatic improvements, maybe even along with all the other kind of NIST and ISO controls um, that kind of dictate cybersecurity. I'd be interested in, you know, understanding, you know, where you think, uh, you, you know, those kind of persistent problems uh, still reside within identity. And uh, Jamie, if I can start with you first. So I did witness some of the certification debates on LinkedIn last night. <laughs> I like how you provoke the conversation for sure. And there were certainly some good some good comments. Some I very much agreed with. Uh, you know, I don't think that certification is necessarily doing what we need it to do because it's just a process that no one looks at all that closely. Now, do I think that there's some output that's certainly beneficial? Yeah. You know, there's some data cleanup. There's some remediation that certainly comes of it. But I would say that for a very long time, what I've seen is that perfection has really been the enemy of good. And in implementations, customers are always so focused on edge cases. They're trying to apply these complex processes that are rooted in very manual and laborious steps and, you know, many transition points that um, really don't need to be replicated. And so they're taking these homegrown processes, homegrown custom interfaces, and they're trying to apply a COT solution to mimic some of their same preferences. So I do think that when you go back to the traditional traditional sense of identity governance and administration, we're not even getting the baseline right. Um, so I think that that's something that's important to, to talk about. And, and where do we need to start from? There's a lot of distraction by the future, um, but there's this inability to just solve the core competencies of, of IAM. Thank you very much for that, Jamie. I, I, I think it's, you know, something you said is really, really interesting is the the, the Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole of fringe use cases um, or edge cases that, you know, I've seen take companies into, you know, months, if not years of arguments, while they're still not making, you know, substantial progress around the 95% or 98% uh, of the identity population doesn't fit into those edge use cases. Um, so I think that's a really interesting observation. Helen, uh, you know, especially uh, kind of the diversity of the university experience, first and foremost, but also with what you do now, um, kind of interesting, same question, like, where do you where do you feel like we continuously stay stuck uh, and, and keeps us from growing or evolving within identity? Yeah, I think there's two places that I'd call out, Richard. I think the first one is, I really believe, um, like them fighting words kind of believe that identity is a security function, not an IT function, not a business operations function, actually. I think it, it is ultimately a security function. It, it exists for security purposes. That's where it started. Um, I get that it has its fingers in all the business operations parts of the pie. So people want to control it. But I think it really should be in security. And I don't think it is. I know it's not consistently part of security teams. I think there is lots of conversations about what parts of identity should be in security. Does it belong in IT? Does it belong somewhere else? So I think organizationally, I'd really like to put a stake in the ground and say it's a security function. It should be managed by security. Um, so yeah, fight me uh, on LinkedIn or fight me here. Someone's going to disagree with me on that one. I know that's the first thing. The second thing I think we're missing, and, and I don't know if it's identities problem or applications problems, but I see a lot of the problems in identity coming from, stemming from the 
from the problem that our applications don't delegate, don't give people the capability of delegating very well. So people share identities because they can't delegate even though they've got a really good reason to delegate. And I see this really on the consumer side of the house. You know, as, as a person who's got aging parents and I've got young adults who need my assistance for a whole bunch of reasons, it's really hard to get delegate access to financial records, to social media accounts, to you name it. It's really hard to get delegate. Like we should, for every account there is on the consumer side, there should be a delegate option. And applications don't do that. And so what do people do? They share their identities and they share that by email and other stupid ways of sharing it. And that's a problem. And I see it also internally in, in organizations. It's not just the executive who wants to give their PA godlike access to everything they have access to. It's the person who's going on vacation who needs to delegate access to a coworker. It's all of those things. We're not seeing, we're not seeing dev security, uh, try again, Helen. We're not seeing application owners think about identity in their use case design for how their application is going to be used. And so it becomes the identity management team's role to gatekeep it. And that's why certification is so messed up. You know, I, I got to jump in there because like, I mean, delegations definitely, you know, of, of high importance if you look back at some of the things I've been doing. And here's the thing that's going to force us to deal with this multi-identity use case. Mm. Um, when you can't sync your password with somebody who you need to represent you, um, or when that's insufficient because you've got MFA in place, then we're, we're stuck, we're dead in the water for, the, for this use case. And I absolutely consider this, I have the, sort of this way I think about all the business drivers of identity and protection is absolutely a driver personalization is also a driver. I mean, for workforces as well as for consumers. Um, payment is something I think it's, it's gotten shorter shrift and in the modern era with DeFi, it gets more shrift. And then people to me is absolutely a business and personal driver. And that's where you find like wanting to connect, wanting to share only selectively. And that's when, you know, what looked like web access management 15, 20 years ago, looks like doing the same thing, only giving the, the power of that to individual people. And I, I consider this to be, you know, we're looking right through it and it's right there. And um, because it involves multiple identities, because it involves relationships, all right, there I said it, um, that's, it, it's, it's absolutely essential and it takes us outside the comfort zone of traditional IAM. And there's, there's those of us who have called it identity relationship management for a long time. And it's really the way to step up, not just the protection, not just the personalization, by the way, also the people aspect of it. So people get what they want out of, you know, sharing health records, uh, bank accounts, um, the rest of it, smart devices. Well, Eva, the delegation piece is interesting to me because, um, you know, I've done a ton of work in Australia. Um, and before COVID, uh, there was a lot of uh, meetings, committee sessions and everything going on around um, CDR, uh, consumer data right and uh, open business, open banking down in Australia. And I remember actually sitting on a panel like this one, just in Australia, and a couple of ministers that were around, uh, you know, and and part of the panel. And I had mentioned uh, the notion of, of medical powers of attorney. I said, it's great to see what you guys are designing. It's ahead of so much of the rest of the world. What are you guys doing about medical powers of attorney? And one of the one of the ministers that was sitting on on the you know panel with me he looked at me and he goes, "Yeah, um, we actually figured out that that's really hard to do. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna postpone doing anything about it." Um, <laughs> Looking for their keys under the lamppost, so to speak. Well, <laughs> it's not here, but that's where the light is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's really fascinating, back to Helen's point, that people are recognizing the the need and the complexity and the challenges of these use cases. And also, back to what Jamie said, that in this particular regard, and instance, particular, particularly on the consumer and citizen side, uh, these aren't, you know, edge use cases, right? The um, I, I, I always use this notion in one of my presentations that, you know, information supplied from the Department of Health and Human Services in the United States says that on any given day, 25% of the U.S. population is under some form of medical order. Like that's a pretty big number, <laughs> right? That's not a fringe use case. So um, excellent. Well, I appreciate um, us digging a little bit in that. We want to, we definitely want to jump into, you know, a couple of details and there's so many things. I felt like it was a stroll down memory lane. I hear wham, 
right? Here's certification, you know, all the good stuff. Um, but when we uh, are looking at a kind of really where where cybersecurity is going, I want to come back to what Helen said. I, I believe it firmly belongs in security. Um, I obviously can come from that um, same fabric um, because that's how I got introduced into identity. When J.P. Morgan Chase decided that identity was a security principle and took it away from you know all of the uh, Windows uh, engineers and uh, consolidated it within the information security space. Um, this is an interesting place, though, because there's still arguments. And last I checked, identity actually has a section in NIST. It has a section in ISO. It has a section in GARDA. Um, we have the, you know, we have the Identity Management Institute in Europe. We have ID Pro in the United States. And obviously, we have, you know, IDSA, you know, who are, you know, all here representing today. Um, why your perception? You've seen a lot of different scenarios. Why is it so hard to convince people that identity is security? When entire, you know, government and quasi-governmental organizations have clearly defined it as such for more than 20 years, and yet that whole reality of of the existing body of knowledge gets ignored. Like, are we just bad at marketing? Like, what is? Why do we have a problem convincing people that identity actually is security? Because um, cybersecurity writ large is so good at marketing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eve, I'll I'll tap you first for that one. Well, you know, I do think it's kind of a brand awareness thing a little bit. I mean, until NIST 800-207 and associated executive orders and things um, around, I'm going to say it, zero trust. And that's when I have to start drinking. Um, cheers. <laughs> cheers. Um, I think that was maybe the start of a kind of awareness that we need. And, you know, I, I call that whole thing kind of a, a 10-year overnight sensation. It's not like we didn't have the concepts of, I don't know, I call it the P star P architecture, you know, PDP, PEP, all the rest of it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not new. It's hard. It's challenging. It's best done actually by professionals in the same way that you shouldn't write your own, you know, crypto package. You probably shouldn't be writing your own handling of what is some pretty sophisticated like MFA options, you know, FIDO and things like that. You know, keeping up with that is hard and it's an arms race. And recognizing that there's a core competency in it, uh, I think is a valuable step towards the light. Just to piggyback off of that, Eve, I think that there's a lack of discipline is what I found. So the right technology is very important, but it's not at the cost of people and process. And that's what takes so much time to evangelize and socialize as you're rolling out these programs, you know, you, you build up some, some momentum, somebody wants to own it, somebody's, uh, you know, taking responsibility for those, those quick and incremental wins, and then it, it just peters out. So then those, those programs tend to fail, and then they're back at it, and they're trying to do it over again. So discipline is a, is a big thing for me. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate that. Helen? I'm going to oversimplify. I, I, I think if, you know, security started as a technology problem and identity has always been a people problem. And so security has sort of stepped back and said, if, it, if I can't throw a tool at it, it's not worth putting in the security bucket. Or frankly, they didn't have the resources to do it because it is a nuanced, complicated kind of problem to deal with, actually. Um, and at the same time, you've got CIOs and CTOs who say, you know, identity is a core of how we how we manage our IT. So therefore, it's got to be a core of the IT function as well. So there's, you know, there's this tension, like things like if if you manage an Active Directory or ADFS or whatever you want to call it, is that an IT function or a security function? Well, I would argue it's a security function, but in most organizations, it's part of the Microsoft shop or the whatever shop. And and it and traditionally it's always been so, and so it will always continue to be so up until I'm gonna say it too, zero trust, and you go identity of people, identity of device, identity of microservice is the beginning of the security perimeter now. So if that's the security perimeter, it should be part of security. And and this is making like IT and 
security people like yeah <laughs> I, 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 so, I so identity <laughs> identity is like the blues notes of the situation because we're falling <laughs> through all the cracks it's like i want it but i want it too i don't want it i don't want it either it can yeah. do multiple things i mean i almost i almost wonder if what can square the circle though is you know siam you know consumer facing identity for people we're not the boss of and you you've lived it right helen it's like you can't make them do things you have to fail gracefully at the right points fraud detection comes into play with the higher yep. numbers and solving it for those hard cases where honestly there's some disjoint concepts like single sign-on really means something different it's a different business purpose um for the different populations um, I've always been fascinated by that, by the way, you know, having all, spent all those years in SAML where all we talked about was, you know, employee use cases. Um, it's, it's like, I think solving the problem sort of for the hard cases, I think it can help inform, and I think it is helping inform due to pandemic era, you know, remoteness and all the rest of it. It's helping to inform how we can do it better for everybody, reducing friction, making sure that there's kind of this no compromises approach to the security and experience, the protection of the personalization. Absolutely agree. Well, I want to. Uh, we're about halfway through our time, and I want to make sure that we open up the window for you know opportunities for our audience to ask questions. So please uh, yeah, enter questions that you have uh, into the comment section, and we'll make sure that um, you know we address them as they come across. Uh, but we do want this to be interactive, and and I'm going to deep dive a little bit in a couple of different things that I heard because um, I think they're really fascinating about what's missing in identity today. Um, you know, for me, one of the things that I heard. Um, uh, is the, you know, the complexity, the challenge of managing identity. And I hear this all the time. Like, yeah, I get it. You know, managing identity is really hard. And I'm always like, you know, manage identity like you manage it in the analog, right? People are people, right? The digital identity that they have, you mentioned John Kindervag, he, he said, there are no human identities. They're all proxies, you know, for us. They're representations of us in the digital world. And then I get the the second uh, rationalization or, or uh, refusal, which is, well, we can't treat, you know, identities like people in, you know, we can't do real world in the digital. And last I checked, cryptography and cryptology is what, thousands of years old, signet rings and all of that. And, you know, firewalls are literally named after something that was built in Rome to protect a library. You know, the, the, the concepts within security have always been grounded in the analog, even as they were being built in the digital, with, again, the one exception seeming to be identity. Right. Um, it's like the it's like the security control that time forgot. Um, and, and when we look at that, I think that it is interesting to me that there's this tension um, with with providing kind of a connection point between real human beings and their digital selves. Right. And, um, you know, Eve, I think you mentioned it on the Siam side, this idea that um, people are no longer satisfied with an experience that's predicated based on an account and password. Um, their, exper their, their experience um, expectations are being driven by a much more richer notion of who I am digitally and what it reps represents to me you know, in the analog or in real life. Um, and yet I see a tremendous amount of slowness as well as kind of fragmentation. You know, who's the buyer? Who, who's responsible for something like Siam? And how do I get, you know, 18 different business units to agree to who owns, uh, you know, a single, you know, representation of a customer can, can we'll go around the horn here, but, you know, Eve, can you start with some, you know, some observations you've had around kind of the challenges of what are really kind of the nascent beginning days of this, you know, consumer facing side, those that you're not a boss of uh, what that's okay. like. Well, one of the things I guess I could say that, uh, about that is um, oftentimes there's been this talk about single view of the customer you know, that a brand has to, has to aspire to. Um, and they aren't necessarily thinking about it. They're missing some, some opportunities and not thinking about it as a single view of you to them. Like, you know, a, a shopkeeper, something on a very small scale in the real world, the relationship that's built is incremental. It grows over time. It's granular. You know, we've talked in this industry about, you know, the creepy feeling that you get if you walk into a hotel and they call you by name before you, you know, announced yourself and all that. But if you were to do that at your dry cleaner, there'd be no shock at all. It would be comfortable. And so um, presenting that kind of transparency and giving that control to people. These are, you know, terms that I use when I talk about kind of the new privacy is data protection is like the old term. <laughs> and it kind of means not letting the data accidentally out. 
And that's a very non-data subject centric view of the universe. And so one of the things that we have to account for is the need to be responsive. And I mean, responsive in the old fashioned, you know, web app responsiveness way in terms of the authentication methods that we provide, the what we reveal about what we know about somebody, uh, how we ask them. I mean, there's obviously regulations about these things now and they try getting tighter and tighter around consent. And it's like slipping through the fingers of the regulators in a sense, because it it deals with all the, the messy stuff. So I think the single view of you to them, to to your, you know, the person you're not a boss of is is a critical part of solving hard security problems and hard problems that businesses have an inherent um, desire to solve. And so, you know, I think identity is finding to a certain degree its level uh, among chief digital officers and chief marketing officers. And, you know, I, I don't want to sort of put it down to privacy compliance. I'm working with a number of companies that really have a higher maturity and, and really want to leapfrog and, and demonstrate trustworthiness. It's got to go both ways. Thank you. I appreciate that. Helen, I know that you've had a lot of experience with people's expectations, especially, like you said, when you're talking about students, alumni, dead people with names on buildings, all those kind of variations. Um, it, what, what's been your observation, the expectation on the consumer side? You know, I um, my my sense of this has changed over time. And where my brain is right now is actually that going back to a, a question you asked, I don't think you can treat people the same way you treat machines and devices and ones and zeros. I think as people, we trust based on all the things Eve just talked about, right? We trust because over time, incrementally, we've got to know you. We've trusted because you've been vulnerable to me and I know that I can be vulnerable to you. Like the, the human element of trust is very different than the machine driven element of trust. And so people, whether they're consumers or employees, are expecting our, our technology to trust them in the same way that people trust them. And it's very contextual. And that is why it becomes really hard to be able to recognize when someone is trustworthy or not. The person who shows up as Helen Patton to the office today could be an insider threat tomorrow. And all my genetics and all my configurations and all of those things are still the same, but my motivations changed. And that's something that is really hard to assert and assess. So we need to be able to recognize that the human element is different and we are going to have to look for external indicators of trustworthiness. But I think what, it, what humans expect is the ability to see those and respond to those and defend themselves against those and our judgments that we make about them. And so that becomes like bruh, in, infinitely more complicated, actually, um, so, which is why I'm looking for things like delegate access, because then I uh, it's one level of assertion that I, I don't have to, like, I need access to this thing on behalf of my parents because they are no longer capable of dealing with it themselves, for example, is a perfectly reasonable assertion to make, right? But we, our machine to machine kind of signals tracking doesn't do that. And I worry as we think about blockchain, yeah, I said it, blockchain, gah, and BYO identity, that, you know, are we are, are we going to put context on the blockchain? I don't think so. Do we want to? I would, is, is context immutable? Do I want it to be immutable? No. So, you know, I, I think there are some really great ideas out there, but I'm not quite sure where we're going to take it or how we're going to take it, recognizing that humans want to be treated as humans and not as ones and zeros. Yeah. I, you know, the context piece is really, really interesting. And Jamie, I'm going to pitch this over to you in just a second. But I, I always like, you know, especially when we talk about blockchain or, or SSI, and you know, we do know that something like marital status is a representation, an attribute within an identity. Right. But if, you know, if I've no, no longer decided to live in the same house with somebody I'm married to and we're separated and my partner clears out my accounts because my actual status is married, but it's complicated. 
that actually doesn't really fit on a blockchain, right? <laughs> like that, That's why relationship has to be kind of a first class object. I mean, yep. being able to do policies basic on that basis, this is literally something that we, the, the UMA work group wrote about really recently uh, in the context of healthcare records. And so it's exactly, you know, Helen, the kind of use cases that you're talking about. So if people want to see that, they can go, go over to, to start and talk about third party, Kantara, uh, and, and take a look at that, that, uh, that white paper. Absolutely. And, and Jamie, I know that you've kind of seen, you know, changes in expectations relative to what the access plane looks and feels like, you know, to, you know, people across the kind of digital spectrum. Just kind of curious if you've got thoughts on the subject. You know, something that uh, occurred to me when he was speaking, he mentioned creepy. Uh, you know, you walk into that hotel, they know your name. So I don't know if any of you watched John Oliver last week, with, uh, last week tonight, but he went on this whole diatribe about the creepiness of user data. And I just thought it was hysterical because, you know, this is at the forefront of what we do. I mean, it was very specific to data brokers, but something that he mentioned as he was talking was the fact that, you know, medical information, when you relay it to a physician, it's protected by HIPAA, but not data that you search for. And so now we are compromising privacy of individuals. So I think that it's, we have to, you know, represent, um, you know, our greater, greater ecosystem, though I specialize more on the enterprise side of the house. It got me thinking about, you know, what is going to change in terms of, you know, federal privacy laws. They've been under consideration for some time, but what are we going to see change within our overall industry to protect some of this data? Because, um, you know, as he said, we're, we're targeting people in a very oddly specific way. That was a hilarious segment, hilarious. by the way, the one on, on data. I mean, Funny because it's true. Also, kind of uncomfortable because it's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I will. I will be using oddly specific in in many upcoming speaking presentations. Oddly specific. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm actually going to weave. We've got some really interesting questions that have come in, and they've all actually kind of been associated with the same theme. So I'm going to try and buckle them together. And one particular statement about a quote from somebody. Um, and and before I say this, um, you may have noticed that we've taken a drink when I say the word zero trust. Um, and, and the reason is because that's our buzzword today, um, you know, for, for taking a sip. But um, I, I, that's somewhat tongue, tongue in cheek because actually Eve and I both sit on Cyber Theory Zero Trust Institute. And I think it's really interesting. Somebody brought up a, a quote from John Kindervag, um, trust is a vulnerability. And uh, yes, absolutely. Trust within the digital is a vulnerability. And that is always the way that, the way that John has referenced it. Um, the digital is, is, a, is systems even talks about it at the packet level. Um, but I would point out that that John and the folks at Cyber Theory thought um, it was really important to bring identity people into the zero trust conversation. And um, and so John is a friend and a much longer friend to Eve uh, than, than to myself. Um, and we talk about this particular notion all the time because identity is the actual interface um, human beings, ultimately, I know that we've got bots and I know that we've got service accounts and all this other kind of stuff. But when we talk about digital services and a means of production that's provided by technology, the interface that is constantly ignored is the human being. Um, and the human being, this is why it's taken 30 years um, to still not fix user experience and to still have massive conversations about user experience because the human being is the interface and this is where the difficult transition comes, because in the human side of the equation, we have to extend trust. And we talk about trust in terms of context. Um, and I think Helen mentioned it. I've seen you multiple times. You've done business with me multiple times. The way I always like to say it is I cannot walk into a, a bank and self-declare that I'm a private wealth management client. Right. The bank gets to make that decision based upon what it knows about me. You know, so as we look at this, and, and I want to bring it around to zero trust, because I think it's always an interesting conversation. One of the questions that we got is, is I think a good secure identity isn't an easy enough for the general population yet. Thoughts on making it easier for everyone to have good identity hygiene. The reason why I think it's a great question that weaves into zero trust is, is that the very foundation of zero trust is you have to understand your inventory. And yet 
every one of us that's on this, uh, this screen today and every one of you out there could walk into your companies or any other company and ask them how sure they are of the asset inventory that is the asset of human beings. People are our most important asset. It's slogans and companies, <laughs> right? How accurate is that inventory in the digital? And um, I'm going to leave it there as a pause because I'd be interested in your notions on how accurate the inventory of identities is and how does that lead into how clean are the inventories of these human assets within these systems? And is that, you know, a, a an indication of a substantial what's missing in identity today? Um, Jamie, I'll start with you. Well, no surprises here. Uh Organizations have no idea. I mean, there's multiple authoritative sources of information. I don't think that there is true visibility across the enterprise. Um, you know, there's truly hybrid environments. Uh, there's very little integration with CMDB. Uh, I, I think that even the ones who have done it well, there's just still so much to accomplish to be able to have that accuracy across the enterprise. That's fair. Helen, I know you're not opinionated on the subject. What What are you thinking? What are you saying, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll tell you a story. When we, a uh, long time ago at Ohio State, we, we kicked off a fishing training, internal fishing program. And when we did the first fish, we overextended on pulling identities out of our identity store and we accidentally pulled people who had passed away. And surprisingly, some of them responded to the fish. And um, it turned out that we had this segment of people who retired from the university but came back as professors emeriti. And HR didn't track them because they were no longer really employees, but they were treated with all the respect of a professor emeriti that should. So they were given access back to systems. But when they died, no one told us, but their spouses were using their identities to get football tickets, right? So there was a process break. Yeah, I know it's Ohio State. What can I tell you? There was a process breakdown in terms of the, the process was HR takes care of employees. Student life takes care of student life. Well, who takes care of the rest, right? And when it came to people who used to be employees who still do stuff, HR wasn't there. And so it wasn't a human problem, it was a process problem, but it leads to this question of how certain are you? And that's just thinking about employees, let alone contractors, research partners, students who are active versus students who are inactive, but are still thinking about coming back to school so we don't get rid of their identity, right? All of, and, and you can see this in customer databases all over the place. We never wanna purge our customer database because they might come back and then they'll want their history and blah, blah. So yeah, this inventories of, people are really hard. Now, if you layer on top of that, why they need the access, and then having the audit trails of the history of what access they had, and why, well, forget it. Forget it. Um, and layer on the complexity of if Helen's just walking through the office and not looking at anything and not touching anything, I don't really care. But when Helen goes through and Helen's using a device to get to another digital device, now it's not just Helen's identity, it's Helen's identity plus device. And there's plus authentication device, plus authorization device, plus login device, plus whatever device. And so now you've got this Lego, I don't know what analogy you wanna call it, <laughs> of compounding identity elements. And we're meant to have, an in, uh, have a CMDB for that? I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, and in the last six months, if anyone's been following me, they know that my track has been oriented to the whole group of identities that you just talked about that land in the space of all other identities. And it's interesting in doing, you know, studies, um, you know, in what I do now with Sexeta um, and doing studies about, you know, companies and how many, what percentage of their identity population is actually their workforce. Like companies are shocked when they find out that it's in the sing single digits of the entire universe of digital identities that they interact with. And they go, well, we got workforce locked down. You go, great, you know, 6% of your attack surface. <laughs> um, and, and the other 94%, you've got no clue, right? And, and Eve, I know you have a lot of experience in this space, so I'd be interested in your observation. Yeah. Well. Uh, it's, it's such a great story because, and no disrespect intended to the, you know, spouses of the, but, 
you know, it's kind of when you have identities that represent benefits, like if there's a, you know, streaming media subscription that you have or, or similar, um, that's where you start to see first party fraud and abuse. And what happened was those changed the nature of what that, you know, the identity is, it's just a, it's a thing inert taking into context what somebody wants to do with it, the delegation thing again that you mentioned, that enables you to get many more signals and be able to make different decisions. And so getting visibility, getting the fine grain of visibility um, is, is super important. It's like we have, it's possible to use sort of dumb tools or tools in a, in a sort of coarse grain, dumb, you know, uh, way. And we've just been finding that it really helps to have I'm going to say artificial intelligence. Is that a drinking word? I don't know. Um, <laughs> when when you talk about the sheer numbers, I mean, even in in the enterprise context, the sheer numbers of entitlement assignments can be easily in the millions. Nobody ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> it's like you know you have to approve an access request. You don't have the context. Actually, getting visibility into the context is where all, you start to have the law of large numbers, and you can apply that you know, use big data, big data tools to that problem. And what it enables is it helps align the incentives better. Like regulation is designed to align incentives and it often does it poorly. It doesn't reflect new technology and new ways of doing things. Um, this is a way, one of the ways that you can use to, when you're thinking about identity, governance and administration to actually align the incentives of the person whose job it is to click yes on access requests <laughs> and the facts on the ground, because otherwise, the you know, it's just as bad as when you're doing a phishing test. It's people's job to click links and emails. It literally is their job all day long to click links that you have to, you know, figure out which ones easily get pulled. Well, it's a lot of them, right? Because the incentives are misaligned. So I, I think one of the things that's missing in identity, it's not that technology isn't there to serve us. It's that we have to understand how different representatives and different stakeholders, including people we're not the boss of, how they're incentivized to behave and not just look for, you know, security education versus kind of the school of hard knocks and incentives and disincentives. So that's my Excellent. Point. Excellent. Well, we have a couple more minutes uh, before the end of, uh, of, end of our uh, panel today. Um, as, as we're leaving, I am going to share, and we've touched on this subject multiple times in this conversation. I do for certain think that one of the biggest gaps that we have in, in identity today is, is that even as identity practitioners, we do not use security terms in how we reference identity. You never hear anybody say uh, identity threat vector, right? You never hear anybody say identity attack surface. You never hear anybody say, you know, any of the common terms that we hear in all of the other, you know, significant domains, you know, whether it's four or nine, you know, whatever your flavor, you know, that you, you uh, choose to pursue from a cybersecurity framework standpoint. Um, we don't talk about identity like it's security. And I do think that we need to change that as practitioners because all of those security terms actually apply when you think about what risk and threat looks like uh, in an identity world. And it is the most exploited um, surface still used uh, today by, uh, by bad actors. Um, identity is the way in. So uh, with that being said, I'll just ask real quick, any leaving thoughts from uh, from our panelists? Helen, I'll start with you. Um, so I'm going to be controversial and I'm going to say I hate least privilege. I think it should be give everybody everything unless they shouldn't have it. I'd love to be able to reverse it. I think we'd be much more resource effective. And let's face it, least privilege ain't working for us. So I throw it out. <laughs> Appreciate that. Jamie? I think as we are doing more with the cloud and um, machine identities, we're going to continue to see that proliferation. And I think that machine identities fundamentally behave as privileged users. And I think that we need to treat those identities as, as being highly privileged. Appreciate that. Neve. Um, you know, I, I love this notion of, you know, questioning hard, least privilege. And this is where I actually think the zero trust concept of protect surface is really doing some heavy lifting that nothing else has really done. It shifts your mindset. It lets you think in terms of fine grain to let access flow, to get smarter about how we use our tools. Um, the tools are all around us. And I think that is a way that we can think of 
to get smarter about using them effectively. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate um, everybody's participation on the panel. Thank you for the questions from the audience. Uh, this has been a great time. I truly appreciate it. And everyone, uh, you know, have a great rest of, uh, you know, Identity Management Day. Talk to you soon. Thank you.